Hey, I'm Scotty from Recharge. On this episode of Hit Subscribe, we're talking to Steve O'Dell, co-founder and CEO of Tenzo T. We chat with Steve about the serendipitous moments that led to founding Tenzo, the importance of using customer data to drive decisions, as well as how to bridge the gap between brand and community using authentic interactions. There's a lot to get to, so let's get started. Steve, thank you so much for joining us. How's it going, man? Thanks for having me. I'm excited to talk about Tenzo. So could you tell us a little bit about yourself and a little bit about Tenzo T? Yeah, so I'm one of the co-founders of Tenzo. We are a matcha brand. Um, for anyone that doesn't know matcha, it's a green tea powder. It's commonly made in like lattes, teas. You can use it in smoothies, things like that. And it's super healthy. It has a little bit of caffeine and um, also L-theanine. Could you walk me back a couple of years ago? Cause you go to Japan and this is where it all comes down. Could you talk to me about some of these like serendipitous moments where you're in Japan that lead up to founding Tenzo T? Yep. So the kind of the, the quick origin story is like one day I drank five cold brews and I was like <laughs> going crazy and, sure. um, and my stomach felt bad. I had like, I was getting like really bad anxiety and I kept feeling like, Oh man, I wish I had another cold brew, but it just, it's like that cycle of kind of ruin. Yep. And um, so I Google searched what's the healthiest drink on the planet and found matcha. And then co-founder Robbie and I were like, oh, how do we buy this? And it started with this guy who was private labeling tea in Arizona, very small. We bought like 50 units and it was like a couple hundred dollars and that's all we could buy. And, um, you know, and then we were fortunate enough to go to Japan and try and meet some of these farmers. And on the last day when we were there, I was in the Kyoto train station, just Googling like tea farms and shops nearby. And we went to one and then we stumbled into like this 70 year old Japanese couple. And, you know, we're these very big American guys and coming in like, where can we see the tea farms? Which is already crazy enough. And um, they didn't understand anything we were saying. So like Robbie is doing like sign language, like just show like picking a tea leaf and, that did not help. And, you know, I had like Google translate going and that did not work. And then we're like, Oh man, this is just not going to work. And so we just started to walk to the next place. It was like 20 minutes away and like 10 minutes into that walk, this black car pulls up like right next to us, the driver's side window goes down and it's the old man that we just met in the shop. And he doesn't say anything. He just gives us this like motion to like get into his car. And so we hopped in his car and then for the next several hours, we visited a dozen or so tea farms all over Japan. And it was like this, I mean, it was like out of a Disney movie and that was like everything we could have asked for. We got a ton of good content and it's a very good experience. And it kind of felt like, wow, like this is our destiny. And then after that, we were on the train ride back to Tokyo as because we were flying out that day. And that guy's boss emailed us and we kind of explained like, hey, what we're doing and we met him several months later um, in Vegas at the World Tea Expo, like in a very like, kind of secret manner. And um, and then, yeah, he became our matcha supplier. He invested in the company. And after that, we were like, this is definitely our destiny to build, you know, the biggest matcha company in the world. Oh, yeah. When you have all those things lining up and the stars are aligning, you got to run with it. You got to listen to the universe. Yeah, ex exactly. So from there, it's been, um, he's a super good dude. He's been super supportive and very lucky to have his partnership and blessed to um, have that experience. So when you're getting this off the ground, are you thinking we're going to sell this in stores? We're going to do direct to consumer. What was like the game plan from the start? Yeah. So, you know, I dropped out of UCLA to start. We didn't know, never taking a business class in my life. Co-founders also never taken a business class. We'd never even had real jobs. So we had pretty much no experience. Um, yeah, I mean, we started, it was, it made sense to sell D2C, right? It's, you know, a consumable that, you know, kind of fits its way into habits and rituals that people have. And it's kind of like an upgraded version on the existing ritual of your morning coffee. And so, you know, we thought that that would be a really good angle to start with. And we started in D2C you know, and we were trying to figure out how that even works. Like we were debating, like, do you use Shopify or WordPress, which is like a crazy thing to think about now. because It's so obvious, you know, and, but just very beginner stuff like that. And um, each day we were working out of this coffee shop 
you know, so we were all living in this super tiny apartment. It was like, I was sleeping on, you know, the couch at this point and we could, we had no space. That was essentially the issue. And we would walk like a block to this cafe and work out of there. And like one day we were leaving the coffee shop and we were just like, Oh, like, why don't we just try and sell matcha to the cafe? And then it was like this boom light bulb moment. And um, so then we did. And then we eventually were like, okay, like, we don't necessarily know how to do D2C super well yet, but like maybe these cafes are going to pick it up and they started picking it up. And, you know, eventually we brought it to like hundreds of cafes in LA and, and it wasn't in any cafes yet in the U S it wasn't in Starbucks. It wasn't in Dunkin'. It wasn't in like anywhere. And, um, a lot of those early cafes picked it up and liked it. And then we would go on the weekends and, you know, just be out front making samples and educating people on how to, how to make it and the benefits. And, um, and then, you know, as the company grew, D2C became, you know, a much bigger factor and a greater percentage of our total revenue. Before we jump in there, I just love to hear, I love asking these kind of questions to founders and entrepreneurs. Can you remember the moment where you looked at your co-founder and you felt like, okay, I think we can do this. Like, I think we're doing it. Is it like the 10th cafe that says yes, or is there anything that stands out to you? I don't know. I had this, this is a good founder little story. So I, I made this wooden plank and I hung it above my bed and it was like number of tens of cafes and like, it took a long time to like get to one. And then it took a, you know, a shorter period of time to get to like 10. And then all of a sudden we were at like 75 and I was, I think that was the moment when like the, the board was like fully filled up with little check marks that I was like, oh man, like this is going to be like a real thing. That's so cool. So now you're moving into DCC and seeing that opportunity there. When you were thinking about that, were subscriptions part of that plan or when did that come to play? Yeah, definitely. Um, subscriptions were key. I mean, when we first started, it, again, like very similar questions, like we were like recharge or bold. And I think we like tested out that um, the other one for uh, like two weeks and then it just didn't work at all. And then we had to kind of switch to recharge. And then, you know, thankfully your team was actually super helpful in getting that off the ground. and that's been a key thing for us for, you know, a number of years now. I love to hear that. And um, I know in an earlier call when we were talking, you said the pandemic kind of accelerated things for you. What's, what's growth been like over the last two years for you guys, at least from the DTC perspective? <clears throat> yeah. So the pandemic was like when it was early March, we had a call with our, um, our other board member, this guy named Justin Blaine, shout out to Justin. And um you know, basically the whole world was kind of crashing around us, all the cafes closed. And, you know, at that point, our wholesale business was 10 times larger than DUC. And we were, he was like, guys, you know, if we're going to keep growing the company, like we need to make a switch and we need to switch like right now. And at that point we were maybe doing, I don't know, like 10,000 a month in DTC, like 50% of that was subscription. So the extremely small numbers. And, um, yeah, I mean, in the last, since what has that been like two and a half years now, a little, maybe three years, it's been amazing. We've like 30 X our DTC business on like a monthly revenue type thing. And it's been super helpful. Um, you know, I've learned a lot and some of the things, you know, we can chat about in a second here, but that's been like our bread and butter for the last several years now. And DTC is just so it's, you know, it was like a massive percentage of our total revenue last year. So it's good. Well, yeah. and, Oh, no, sorry. Go for it. No, I was just saying like, and there's these, the comparables are like athletic greens is doing like 120 million a year or something crazy. It's like they're a sing, single product powder, very similar to Tenzo. And it's like, you know, we, we hit on a lot of those same themes from a cost standpoint, you know, LTVs. And it's like, you just got to keep driving that and growing the business. Yeah, let's talk about that a bit, because I'd love to talk about um, your retention efforts, your retention strategies. We were talking earlier uh, in another call. I just loved hearing about kind of this, how you were leaning into data and plugging in a bunch of different data points and allowing that to guide you without giving away anything you don't want to. Could you tell us a little bit about some of the data you guys use to, to make sure you're following the right steps for retention? Yeah, for sure. Like for all the founders listening to this, the data is the most essential part of e -com. And once you have a very clean system of, you know, getting all the data and analyzing the data, then you can make the decisions in your e-commerce engine, let's say, which is a word for a full funnel experience to manipulate that data in your favor. 
you know, and so the key one to start is like, you know, what is your margin and what is your payback period? You know, are you going to be profitable on first purchase? You know, and if subscription, like how long, you know, do you need to retain a customer to pay off the money you spent on the product and the acquisition cost? So those are kind of the, the, the base bone, but then it's like, well, Tenzo did, which I think really helped us get from like, say like 50K a month to like 250,000 a month. The key point there was like, we built out a custom dashboard that piped in everything, you know, in the e-commerce engine. So that was like all of the Klaviyo flows, all the Shopify data, all the recharge data, the SMS data, the reviews data, you know, Google analytics, all of our media spends, TikTok, Facebook, Pinterest, Snapchat, like everything is piping into this database, right? And then from there, what we did was we did an analysis called optimal binning, which essentially we were like, all right, what is the path that the customers took that had the highest LTV? And then all these different kind of bins, which are like the level of customers, like your highest quality customers, they took this, this series of steps. A middle tier set of customers took this series of steps. And then what we figured out was like, oh, like if we upsell this product, those customers have a higher LTV, you know? And so then we optimize all of our upsells based on, you know, the ones that have the highest LTVs. Um, another really good lesson was we looked at using our data from our 3PL. It was like, how long does it take for a customer to get their order? And what we realized was that customers that got their order in under six days had a significantly higher LTV than customers that took over six days. You know, and there's all these kind of like, you can think about like why that is, but we just really were like, all right, let's just, you know, follow the data on this one. And then we optimized just all the things on that note. And um, our retention numbers grew a lot, which meant that we could spend more money on paid ads and essentially you can outbid all of your competitors if you can spend more money on the ads. And yeah, then, and that flywheel just keeps on going, eh? It just keeps going. Yeah, and, and then it's like, okay, then you get more data and analyze it in better ways. It's stronger. And the, yeah, this, it just builds this flywheel that's really, really powerful, especially for you know subscription businesses. And something I really loved about Tenzo T, and you can tell me if this is one of these things you developed over time, I'm, I'm sure it is, but was the trial kit itself. For those who don't know, you guys provide this Tenzo trial kit, which has got the whisk, it's got the powder, it's got the instruction manuals and how to do this. Was yeah. that always part of the plan or is that something you guys recognized? Like we need to provide a little more supplemental content to really hook people on this ritual. Yeah, that was actually a big one. So like the first part about the trial kit was like what goes in the kit. Mm -hmm. And going back to that same retention study we did, we analyzed the trial kit. And so like in, we, we made all these different kits. We made like one that had just a shaker bottle. It's like this, but there's matcha in it. The other one had the electric frother and the other one had the bamboo whisk. And we sold them identically to, you know, thousands of customers. And we looked at the retention, you know, curves for each of those. And the electric frother had the best one. Then we figured out like, that's kind of how we nailed down the items. And then secondly, we did um, a study that's like, all right, there's all these items. Like what happens if we improve one of the items? So like before we were buying the frothers that like weren't custom branded, our tins were also, they used to have a sticker on it. And it's like, we took the tins instead of putting a sticker on it, we did like a full production run in China to get custom made tins. So then we have like tin skew, you know, one versus the old one, Tinsky zero. And what we noticed was that Tinsky one also had better retention than Tinsky zero. So then it's like, we have this kind of cycle of product development where if you improve, you know, the aesthetic of the products, um, the retention gets better. So that just keeps pushing us down this kind of funnel of optimizing for LTV and high retention. I, lo I love that. And just how data driven that is. And just, yeah, like you said earlier, just following the numbers and continuing to iterate and innovate off it. It's just awesome. Yeah. It's that, it, that's e-commerce. You know, <laughs> yeah. In a nutshell, let's talk a little bit about um, community building. Something I love that you guys do is you got this Facebook group. You have a lot of likes on Facebook, obviously, but deeper in the Facebook group is this 1600 plus member private Facebook group. Um, yeah. This community group that you've developed. So could you tell me a little bit about the origins of that and how you cultivate community inside that? Yeah. So again, this goes back to 
retention. I'm sorry to just keep being no, keep do it. On that. <laughs> but it's like that is an, a way for us to engage our subscribers, for them to feel like they're a part of the brand. And, you know, in that group, we share recipes, you know, advice on how to use mantra. We answer questions. We send them polls, you know, and learn about our customers and get to know them. And like every week we send out like a welcome message that's like, hey, welcome to, you know, the 30 new people, the 100 new people into the group. And, you know, then my co-founder and I, Rob, and our community manager will go in and we'll, you know, comment like, hey, nice to meet you or you know, I know someone that lives in that city. Like I've been there, you know, whatever it is that we're talking about. Um, but yeah. And then it also like kind of bridges that gap between a brand speaking to an audience, um, which, you know, I think is one way to look at it. It's like a lower tier version of a community. And really the, the magic happens in a community when the members get to meet each other, um, you know, and know each other, learn about pro the product, just learn about like living a healthy lifestyle and, you know, being better and, you know, what that's like. I love you talking about the effort there. Cause it's one thing just to be like, Hey, welcome. But to actually provide a genuine message, you know, you just get so much more. This is now looking at it from a business, but like you get so much more return on investment when you're actually providing a genuine message to these people. So they feel like they're not a, they feel like they're part of a community and not just a brand's Facebook group. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, you know, most Facebook groups are frankly, they kind of suck and they're dead. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, and if you want to really create that kind of magic, um, you really, you need to be active. And, you know, we get so many posts like every single day, every hour, people are just blowing it up with all these different things, you know, so you, you got to do it. Otherwise it's kind of just a waste. Let's flip over to Instagram. And I know TikTok's on the rise too, for you guys, Instagram, 42,000 followers and counting, like no small numbers here. Uh, could you talk a little bit about the power of UGC and maybe how you guys leverage that kind of content? Yeah. Um, UGC, you know, gotta love it. I think that's like the most important type of content, you know, and a lot of posts on Instagram are really just trending to become like this, just kind of like visual billboard, like digital billboard, I guess, of like highly aesthetic content. And, you know, but the, the bread and butter is really like, you know, partnering with influencers and regular people to just create like very simple, you know, I don't want to say it, but low quality for some of them, just very organic content then, you know, and I think why that really sticks well is because it speaks to the customer and they don't feel like this is like a Coca-Cola or Nike ad. It's just like someone that's like me, um, you know, and I'm saying that not me specifically, but anyone, you know, if you watch a video, it's, it's very relatable, believable. And those types of things really build trust in a way that a highly produced video or image doesn't. I totally agree. You're seeing that rise so much in content over the last couple of years in terms of like commonality, it being authentic. These like polished videos, they don't perform as well because people just like you said, don't see themselves in it. I just saw one today, one of your latest ones, and it was just someone literally in workout gear, like showing the start of their day with Tenzo T. And it's just awesome. Just like a quick little thing, easy, boom, it goes up and gets likes and traction. Yeah, it's really great to see. Exactly. Yeah. And I think you just take that one step further. TikTok is even more organic. It's like you really TikTok to be successful. You want like a 22 year old college kid to like show why they yeah. like Tenzo and like do it in a very funny, organic way in like their dorm room. And that's what really sticks. It's, it's far less produced. Yeah. It's hilarious. When I started on TikTok, I was trying to make, trying to make things polished and seamless, just like bringing in film school quality stuff. And like, that's not what necessarily does well. It's shooting on your phone. Just like you said, like using the music, using these trending sounds and voiceovers and, and that's exactly. how it like feeds the algorithm and goes from there. You know, you um, should just do, um, do a video with your iPhone about all the equipment you're using to make actually highly produced videos. And that would probably do great. A hundred percent. It would do much better than anything else. Um, you kind of touched on it here, but I would just love to hear from your perspective as well, from your own blog, from your own site, what content have you noticed that performs the best? Listen, I'm just going to give you the answer because I saw it and it's, you guys are killing it with recipes. I feel like that's like such a great way for you guys to connect with customers. Yeah. Recipes kill it. And, um, we started really diving this in like three years ago at this point. And how we did that was we looked at like 100 historical emails and we analyzed like open rates and click through rates and stuff like that. And recipes won like by far. Mm. And that became kind of this backbone to, you know, of content for us. And you know, it goes in the blog, it goes in the emails. And it, it also like is a very educational thing with a food product. 
Um, cause if you don't know, like matcha isn't just like for lattes, like I was in Pittsburgh last weekend, you know, and I had a few friends over and we made cocktails, you know, and matcha cocktails are great, you know, and you can also put it in pastries and my mom uses it, you know, during St. Patty's day and other holidays to make frosting green. Um, you know, so like kind of just educating customers about that and the ways that they can use it is, is a very powerful thing. And a lot of people in our community really enjoy that type of content. Yeah, I've had a matcha cookie before. Very delicious. Definitely recommend it. Um, Let me throw some rapid fire questions at you before we close this thing out. Uh, What advice would you give to a subscription brand that's just launching out, has no subscribers, but is thinking subscription might be good for their brand? Um, Subscription is great for your brand. (laughs) Definitely do it. And um, make sure you have like basic systems for understanding the data right away. Um, You know, LTV, 30, 60, 90 day payback periods, that kind of thing. And then test as much as you can to improve that over time. All right. Now you're a subscription brand. You got maybe a thousand followers, sorry, subscribers, maybe 10,000 subscribers. What advice would you give to try and um, help them scale and, and continue to grow? Honestly, double down on data, follow the retention example I gave earlier. And then once you know that, figure out your allowable ad spend and, you know, spend as aggressively as possible. Last one, very basic. What physical subscription products do you subscribe to? I um, want to shout out Paul Vogue, uh, the founder of Ourobora. They are a weird water company. Um, and yeah, I love their products. Great for everything. And um, shout out Paul and the team there. Love it. Well, Steve, thank you so much for spending the time with us today. And we wish you and Tenzo T the best of luck for the rest of the year. Thanks a lot. I appreciate the time as well. We'd like to thank Steve once again for joining us. If you're interested in Tenzo T, head over to tenzot.co. And if you're looking for more of our episodes, check us out at rechargepayments.com slash hit subscribe.